two, one. Hi, everyone. This is Paul Casey, the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame educational video series. And now, my friends, we are changing gears on you. In the past, we've had special guests, and we interviewed them and gave us our insights, thoughts about Kempo, their journey. And today, we're moving in a different direction. We're going to go more into the academia side. So I call it the Art of War Kempo style. And we're going to open it up to all of the participants to give their two cents, input, what their thoughts are, the past of Kempo, the present Kempo, and the future of Kempo. So with no further ado, welcome to the Hall of Fame. And I am grateful to have with us Dennis Knatzer, Zachary Carter, Gil Hibben, Greg, Hildebrand, and others to come as well. So let's admit everybody. So let's start it off with Today's discussion is academia, and if you look at if you look at the history of Kempo, I'm going to use two treatises to reflect on what we're talking about. Something from 2,500 years ago, the Art of War, with Sun Tzu and his principles, and then something from 38 years ago, which would be Ed Parker and his Infinite Insights. So that'll take us up to the late 80s, 90s before Mr. Parker died. Then we're going to now talk after that and discuss things about the future of Kempo. Where has it progressed from 1990 to the present day? And where are we at with that? And personally, I always like to use metaphors to reference things. And one of them would be, uh, if you look at our salutation and discussing this with Mr. Knatzer and a few other people, Mr. Carter, we use the right hand as the warrior. Okay, obviously the physical aspect, that of the tiger. Then we use the left hand of the scholar of the dragon. Has Kempo fallen since Mr. Parker's death? Has uh, the academia side of Mr. Parker's teaching sort of ignored? Are we more interested in having a right hand warrior that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger and our left hand looking like Barney Fife? It's the truth. Ask yourself that, because it seems to be right now the present trend in Kempo, especially in social media, is that I'm more interested about looking good. I want to wear a high rank. I want to have as much red on my belt as I possibly can. I want all my buddies to tell me, hey, you're good. You're good. Well, if you're great, they'll tell you you're great. That's a Walter Payton uh, comment. So I quoted him on that. So let's go on to that. Let's ask a question or two that Mr. Knatzer always asked me when I first talked to him, and he reminds me of occasionally, and it's about the four questions. So, Mr. Knatzer, why don't you take center stage here and tell us about how much Kempo. How much Kempo do you know of? How much do you know? Thirdly, how much do you actually understand? And then fourthly, how much can you apply? And, you know, we, you know, I, I refer to this all the time because as we're talking and, and I'm teaching, you know, we'll go into things. And as I, I get into more detail with stuff, I, I sometimes can get, uh, you know, and my good friend, Skip Hancock, uh, really is another one that's fun to, to, to talk to because he, he really has a great understanding. And we, we go into uh, microscopic detail on, on movement sometimes. And of course, being a physical education major, you know, with kinesiology, you know, as a background, it, it I, I thought I was going to be teaching football and how to do spin moves on the line and all that kind of thing. As it turns out, it, it worked to my advantage to be in Kempo because I, I use it all the time in Kempo. I mean, it's human movement. It's mano a mano. And how can you take advantage of your, your, your opponent? As in book one, Mr. Parker said, you know, the idea of Kempo is to, you know, be able to put your opponent into continual a position of, of, of uh, you know, being able to take advantage of his weaknesses and keep yourself in a position of authority. And, uh, you know, it, it just makes sense. And, of course, we, we need to do certain basics like maneuvering to, to be able to accomplish that. So, you know, that gets into how much do you know of, how much do you know, how much do you actually understand, and of course, the, the the bottom line is how much can you apply? Let's go to uh, Dr. Totten. Can you hear me, sir? Dr. Totten, can you hear me? Ah, there you are. How are yes. you doing, sir? Uh, you know, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ta uh, Mr. Totten, obviously you're one of the most uh, well-versed aficionado on 
on the martial arts history. Can you give us some input of the uh, the art of war and, and maybe in how that might have influenced uh, Mr. Parker and his thoughts? Because you spent a lot of time talking with him. Um, Mr. Parker certainly was aware of the uh, art of war, as I'm sure a lot of us, uh, you know, are. You know, some of those uh, principles have been, uh, you know, spoken of for forever, you know, for, you know, hundreds of years. And um, I think that uh, thinking about combat as something beyond just the physical, as something that's strategic, was something that Mr. Parker was very interested in and certainly was something that was taught in the art of war. Um, learning how to uh, plan uh, something in advance, learning how to take, as, as uh, Dennis just said, how to take advantage of a situation as it, uh, not only as it occurs, but as the practitioner may have helped it occur. <laughs> you know, you know, we, as you all know, you know, we can do certain things to arrange a situation so that it probably goes down a certain way. And Mr. Parker spent a lot of time, I think, thinking about that. And as a result, he set up Kempel to be kind of a thinking person's, uh, you know, martial art. You know, it isn't just, you know, punch, 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 kick, 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 and, 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 until, you know, you, you know, fall down, uh, although that was part of it too. But Mr. Parker always thought about what he was doing before he did it, as he was doing it, and as he was exiting from a situation. You know, he was very, very strategic at all times. You know, the man's, I tell people all the time that I, I was, every second I was with Mr. Parker, I was literally in awe of his intellect. You know, he, most of the time when he was talking to me, he was using the language of a mathematician or physicist or someone. And, uh, you know, I felt I needed to go back to school to just understand what the heck he was talking about half the time. <laughs> well, Dr. Totten, if that, in the, in the situation in your, in your talk, Mr. Parker obviously was approaching it from a very analytical situation. Yes. How do you convey that, Greg? How do you convey that to, to the young martial arts today that you have these publications that I've referenced here that he has five volumes. How do you, how do you get a, a new student or a, a student that you have today to look at material from say 38 years ago and to understand that? You're, you're referring to the infinite insights of Mr. Parker's writing? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm trying to draw a comparison between the well, art of war and, and, and Parker's infinite insights. Right away, the correlation between the two for me, of course, my viewpoints are mine and their work. My viewpoints in a nickel in one hand, you'll have a nickel. But the thing is, uh, uh, the, the parallels, I've been, they're both very versed, based in principles, right? But as far as new students, are, I run a, it's a lot more difficult sometimes for me to have people who've been training or so-called training or studying the art or whatever for, a period of time to embrace the book, the infinite insights. It's much easier to have beginners or new students because it's kind of like I tell them it's men, it's kind of like mandatory. They're like your textbooks. I look at uh, infinite insights one through five and uh, encyclopedia of Kempo and Zena Kempo as your textbooks of American Kempo if you're studying Mr. Parker's system and his art and his logic. But as far as the correlation between his writings, the infinite insights, and uh, Sun Tzu, right away I just start looking at the correlation effect. They're both based in strong principle. Sure. You know, it's funny. I was talking with Zach Carter today, and he reminded me of, of, uh, a, of a quote from Lao Tzu, and I will say it in a moment, but uh, there, was a, there was a post reply about this, this actual series of videos that we'll be talking about and discussing. And uh, one of the responses was simply was, I know enough Kempo. <laughs> and when I heard that, I don't know that, if that's possible. Uh, I then remember what Zach said. He said, Sons, uh, Lao Tzu said, a stupid man will die a stupid death. So with that in mind, let's talk to Joe Rebello. Joe, we're trying to draw a correlation between Ed Parker's infinite insights and modern treatises 38 years ago. <laughs> to Sun Tzu's Art of War. Can you help us to understand uh, the relationship between these two 
uh, strategy uh, uh, of, of, of fighting? Well, the art of war is more than just a strategy of fighting. Well, first of all, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, we can, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Well, Sun Tzu's book, again, is it's a book of philosophy. It's a, it's a book of um, strategic decorum, uh, of theories and concepts and principles. Uh, however, uh, it's, it's, in many ways, it's purposefully vague. Um, the, the, the correlation of it, like, I mean, you cannot, in modern society, in the Orient, um, advance in business without learning Sun Tzu's Out of War. It's required. That, and in the Orient, and the Japanese culture, the Go Rin No Show, the Book of Five Rings by Miyamoto Musashi, they are books of strategy. Now, the difference between that and Mr. Parker's system is that Mr. Parker's Infinite Insights are far more precise. They are far more articulate. They are far more um, exact in their understanding. When I talked to Mr. Parker about why he wrote Infinite Insights, and it was in the same conversation I had with him, I asked him, how did he get his 10th degree black belt? And a lot of people consider it sacrilege, I even asked him. But I really wanted to find out because it was his system. And when I talked to him, he was like, I wanted to create what makes, he said, what makes all the different masters, different arts, not just martial arts, but all the arts. And he said, what was the one salient feature they all had? Madame Curie, Jonas Salk, Picasso, Michelangelo, Da Vinci. What did they all have in common? And he said, a masterpiece, a piece of work, a body of work that stood the test of time. Mm. That's what Mr. Parker wanted Infinite Insights to be. That was his opus. That was Ed Parker explaining Ed Parker's Kenpo Karate. Have we deviated from that? Have we deviated from that? Have we lost sight of the of Mr. Parker's writings? I think we lost sight because people are definitely one, it's tougher to get the books. <laughs> Two, people don't read them. Three. People claim they read them, and then when you take them to task and ask them about things, and they look at you like a deer in the headlights going, huh? You know, you kind of you know, <laughs> read the book. I can always count on you, Joe, to bring some color, full responses to your answer. Am I lying? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just being honest about it. Well, let's there move over. People- Let me ask Zach Carter. Zach, explain to us the art of war in your opinion. It's a strategy for life. Basically, you can apply it to business, you can apply it to martial arts, you can apply it to love, you can apply it to a lot of things. What is the the number one principle then from the art of war? Open mind. Open mind? Open mind. Do Uh, unto others, then split. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, my quote is that that if I read, and Dr. Todd will probably correct me on this, all warfare is based on deception. So I don't know if I want to really use that love. You know, that might not work. On the other hand, maybe about that. morning at the bar when you're leaving, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Dr. Totten. Didn't want to do it. That's why I think one of Mr. Parker's uh, chief principles was environmental awareness. Exactly. Because uh, that and acceptance, you know, acceptance that something, it's possible for something to occur. And if we ha- are, are aware of our surroundings, of our environment, very often we can avoid something because we see it coming. Rather than just walk into situations and then have to just try to fight your way out of it. And there's certain situations that I don't care who you are, you're not going to be able to fight your way out of. A lot better if you don't get into it in the first place, or if you have no option to enter into that environment in a very strategic fashion in terms of how you place yourself, where you place yourself uh, in relation to your attackers, what objects are around you that you might use to block or to obstruct or to utilize as weapons to defend yourself against uh, uh, an attacker or attackers, plural, uh, in an environment. You know, there there are certain environments, combat situations 
that I'd never walk into barehanded, for example. I'd have to have a weapon in my hand or I'm gonna probably die. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then other times, if I brought a weapon into certain encounters, it would be overkill because I don't need that level of firepower to defend myself successfully. You know, I need to do something less and there's less legal and other com complications as a result. You know, if somebody grabs my wrist and I rip out their eye and grab them in the throat and tear out their larynx, well, they're dead, but uh, where am I gonna wind up? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> you well, well, you already got halfway there. You look good in stripes. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> I didn't say that, sir. Okay, hey. let's go to Todd Durgan. By the way, Todd Durgan is going to be our special guest. We'll return to the Campbell Karate Educational Video Series, and we'll be uh, spending some quality time with Associate Master of the Arts, Todd Durgan. Next week, he's going to be discussing. Uh, uh, his ideas, concepts, and principles of the universal pattern and yeah. related. But right now, Todd, can you help us to understand some of these considerations that Mr. Parker talked about in volume one of his Infinite Insights? Well, it's funny because <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm a little late to the game, but can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Um, it's funny because, you know, when we talk about deception, I know that's not one of the uh, one of the considerations, but when we talk about deception, I think that we really need to look at that a little more in depth with regard to what is deception. And deception, in my opinion, can include uh, something else that's very important uh, called communication. And in any combat situation, we have a communication between uh, combatants. And that communication is sometimes telegraphing, sometimes deception, sometimes uh, you know, physical uh, implementation of distance, weapon angles, and all of those things. So uh, I just, I heard, uh, I'm not sure what his name is there, talk about deception with regard to the art of war. Uh, but I think that really there's more, there has to be more communication. If we look at communication too, and we, we pay attention to environmental awareness, right? We're, we're then uh, participating in and communicating with our environment and the the elements therein. Well, I see. You know, go ahead. I'm sorry, let me, Dennis. Let me, let me just let me let me just say, you know, when we get into environment, how how do you? I mean, when Miss Parker first asked me that, I said, well, you know, of course, you know, environment, everything around you. You know, I mean, if it's snowing outside, if it's if it's wet, if it's whatever, and of course, at that point, he said, no, environment, as Kempo should understand it, and I understand it is anything in, on, or around you. Right. And, you know, so as you, it's not just a matter of you personally, like if you're inebriated, you're, you're obviously not gonna be at your A game. Uh, you know, so anything in, any, you know, any on you, if I'm, if it's cold outside, if I'm in New Bedford, Massachusetts in the middle of winter, and I've got, you know, six layers of clothing and a heavy parka on, I'm not gonna be as maneuverable as I could be. So I'm gonna have to be creative and learn how to work within the parameter that I'm that I'm in, you know. And and here's the other thing too: it's not, it doesn't just apply to you, but it also applies to how well you read your opponent and what are they in on mm -hmm. or around them. Right. So and that can be a, a big determining factor on what choices you have in terms of defending yourself. Because goes, I mean, they. Could, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That goes, and in my opinion, that goes back to the communication thing where you you have to read and understand That's the correct. body language, the position, the ability, yes. the capability, and the possibilities of those people in, your envi in and on and around your environment. Absolutely. I agree. Todd, so, you know, yeah. it's funny. Watching you, I feel like I'm, you're incognito, like, yeah. you know, like <laughs> secret or something. It's like he's, it's he's like we're on fuzzy networks, like saying, hello, yes, I'm <laughs> going to tell you, you the go. secrets. But there, here, okay. there we go. Yeah. Yay, there's he's Todd. Got a, got a All right, son. Todd. <laughs> you know, <laughs> keeping it light. No, actually, I'm going to quote directly from Sun Tzu. He said there are the five heads. He calls them the moral law of heaven, earth the commander and the method discipline. When he's referenced, it was a little less um, extensive as Mr. Parker fleshed it out with his eight. But these things do relate. So he says that 
uh, the moral law causes the people to be in complete accordance with their ruler. They will follow him regardless of lives undismayed by any danger. He says, heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. You can see how this is going to overlap into Mr. Parker's con eight considerations. He says that earth comprised of distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, and the chances of life and death. The commander stands for virtues of wisdom, which is what you were relating to, uh, Mr. Knatzer, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. And the last aspect of his five heads was that the method and discipline are to be understood by the marching of the army by its proper subdivisions the graduations of rank among the officers, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at Parker's eight considerations, which he has in here, and it's enumerated, a lot of that has flushed out a lot more in detail what, what Sun Tzu was talking about. So it has evolved, and it's a little more particular to us in our training of Campbell. However, how many people are actually following these or just sort of – you know, flat, going around, fluffing in the room, not sure where to find the exit or the light switch. And that's sort of sad. So why don't we go with that in mind? Zach, what are your thoughts on that? Why aren't people going back to Parker's uh, book, which is accessible? You can pick it up. It's not very expensive. And start to relate to this. Well, the first reason I would think is, is that it takes work. And it takes time. And a lot of people nowadays, especially younger generation, not all, of course, they just don't want to take the time to do that. And a lot of that is something that you have to read and you have to constantly re-examine. I mean, I'll read a book, you know, 30 years ago, Infinite Insights. I'll read it again today and I'll get something completely different out of it. It's, it's a constant re-examination, you know, as we go. That's what I love about this art. There's so many facets to it. I can go over things and then stay away from certain parts of the art, a form or a technique, et cetera, and then return to it and see it in a whole new light. So you're constantly well, I, learning and evolving. What I'd like to add to that, uh, Zach, is uh, you're absolutely right. I call it a, con Kempo is a continual process of renewal. It's, it's not something that you just, I mean, like you say, I mean, you could be a, a fifth degree black belt or whatever, and you can go back and, and look at the yellow belt and find new things. Are you checking the leg? Are you buckling? Are you are you finding, uh, you know, angles to cancel the other person's, you know, any of his options to he's totally nullified? I mean, so on and so forth. So there's there's it's a constant process of renewal, and I think that pretty much sums it up. And that that goes with all phases, including reading the books. The problem with today's books are, first of all, you have to have desire to read the books. You have to have desire to learn. You have to have leadership in which to point you to where you can find some answers and find these books, you know, and, and start reading them. Then once you get the book, what did you get out of the book? What are the high points? I know I've had people say, I've read the books. No, I'll go back and I'll start asking them questions like, well, what did you get out of the book? Did you go to book one, page one and find three points of view? And you know, that that's a start. And then we, we go from there and then we start going from there and, proceed on to, you know, subsequent chapters of, you know, three divisions of the art and so on and so forth. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, you know, the thing is, you know, there needs to be a leader to kind of direct the student, just like we direct them in physical. We've got to direct them into where to learn stuff and, and what they're actually reading. We don't just assume that they're going to pick up everything they need to learn just by reading it themselves. This, uh, by the way, this, this gathering here is not limited to just the speaker that you're hearing. We're going to bring in a few other people. And Hello, Marshall. Welcome Hi. to uh, the uh, Art of War Kempo style. And as you can see right now, we have Zachary Carter, Dennis Knatzer, Greg Hildebrand, Ruben. How you doing, Ruben? You're next on the mat, so you better be ready. Gil Hibben, <laughs> Carl, Dr. Carl Totten. I'm really an honor always to see him. Master Joe Rebello from New York, Todd Durgan. Uh, Dave's iPad. Now, I'm guessing Dave is waiting for uh, Cheech and Chong to show up. I don't know. Hello. Dave's not that? here. Dave's not that. here, man. We have Rodolfo <laughs> Kunstman all the way from Chile. How you doing, Rodolfo? You're up next on the mat, too. So, Marshall. Yes, sir. How much involvement do you get with reading Mr. Parker's uh, writings, The Infinite Insights? Do you reference to that? Have you looked at other uh, treatises on strategy, like 
the Book of Five Rings. Um, I, I thumbed through the, the Book of Five Rings. Uh, what I learned... What I learned from the books, I, I kind of try to find in other art forms, not just, not just in, in martial arts, but like in science and math and, and art. And so you ever play with like a lot of sacred geometry? You ever heard of that, that type of stuff where those patterns work in? You bet. And a, a lot of those patterns that I've seen in some of the videos play always, always stir the the practice of the art and understanding how to, to to demonstrate and i use the geography and how to explain some of the methods of execution or the technique itself or what i'm trying to get across i'm kind of put on a spot here i wasn't ready for this but <laughs> um, that's what this is which call put Campbell. you on the spot <laughs> yeah uh you're doing fine i like Keep going. I, my favorite book out of the whole series is four and always has been actually that was the first book i read before i read one two three and five and why is that tell us um, why is that marshall the internal part of the art is really what really what motivated me to learn the the art itself and even as a kid when my parents tried to take me to like taekwondo or shaolin kung fu I never liked it because every time I asked the teacher something, they always said, oh, just do what I'm telling you to do. They never explained why. And I was like one of those kids that were very inquisitive and I needed to know how things work. Whereas the Infinite Insights series outlines ideas and a framework which makes the entire system a lot more palatable for the beginner. As so a why beginner. Four? Why, why book four first then? Um, because I, I had, I had, I had trouble understanding what, what Mr. Kondega was teaching me at the time. I was a very, very young student, like yellow belt. And he was talking about the, the tea kettle principle. And it went into a couple of jewelries. I was understand how to, I guess, I, I started to understand how what fusion was and the explosive timing and focusing power. I couldn't understand that by someone explaining it to me. I, that was one of those things I had to read to understand but the culmination of a good teacher using the reference material and helping and Mr. Kagaki helping me to apply it to my own learning and tailoring it to my learning guided me into deeper into the system. But thank you, Marshall. I was able to let's let's go to Dr. Totten. Dr. Yeah. Totten. Yeah, I was just thinking that one of the things that I really appreciated all along about book four is um, you know, all of the explanation and diagrams, charts in there. Uh, on the uh, universal pattern. You were talking about sacred geometry, which basically is what that universal pattern is, which is kind of the fundamental pattern of pretty much everything in the universe and existence. Oh, Dr. Totten, Dr. Totten, you're opening up a can of worms with Durgan now. Yeah, we're gonna get into, <laughs> we're gonna get into that really deep next week. <laughs> it's gonna I, be, but hey, we got a taste. I Let's thought, talk I, about that, Todd, I just thought, briefly. Well, I thought Marshall would touch on that being the reason that he liked book four because it because that's the first introduction in um uh graphic form to the universal pattern where you know and in my opinion yes. and we'll get into this more but in my opinion mr parker only ever very briefly touched on the universal pattern and what its purpose as a tool for teaching truly is and sure. it's far 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 more than just a couple of geometric shapes he yes. was waiting for you to come along yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, while we're on the subject, I'm going to throw it over to Zach Carter when we talked about three dimensional on the mm. universal pattern. And I have my little ball. This ball is in the background. Oh. And I put him inside this little ball. And I said, hey, come into the trap and explain to us. So, Mr. Carter, please uh, so talk about this. So, hey, just real quick, uh, next week when we're on, I'll show you my three-dimensional uh, print that I have of an actual three-dimensionally printed universal pattern. Oh, really cool. I'm looking forward to that. Anything like that. Anything, you know, a lot of people like visual. Some people mm -hmm. are analytical and they like to read. Some people like to be physically shown how to do some. Some need a reference. And that's the right. beauty of what our art is. It's, it encompasses all of that. 
So well, the know, problem, I'm going to go back to Dr. Totten, though. Um, are we lacking with our instructors uh, actually stepping it up and, and, and growing in the art through the mindset? Or are we just too stuck into the physical aspect? You know, I think um, in Kempo, there's a wide range of, of understanding. Uh, some people uh, approach Kempo as a very uh, physical practice and they, the way that they practice it, understand it, and teach it is strictly pretty much as a physical practice, whether that's self-defense or competition or uh, uh, personal kind of uh, uh, health development, but it, they approach it in a very physical way. Uh, Mr. Parker, of course, did that but he always was thinking about why he did something, not just how to do it, but why, and under what circumstances one would choose a particular approach to combat as opposed to another approach to combat. He always said that one should take multiple perspectives, you know, the perspective of you looking at an attacker, uh, what if someone was across the street watching the attack, uh, what would they see? Uh, what what uh, if if what if you had eyes in your shoes and your feet? What would your feet see? <laughs> you know, what would your left hand see? What would your right hand see? You know, this kind of multi-dimensional perspective. You know that he, I think the way he saw things. I remember one day I was at his house and he told me that he said, you know, he said that uh, Kempo is like a um, uh, uh, is multi-dimensional. He said it's like a pyramid. And what you can see peeking out of the water on top is just a tiny fragment of what Kempo contains. And like he an says, iceberg. yeah, yeah, like an iceberg, you know, a pyramid or an iceberg. And okay. he says, and he says that sometimes he says, he said, I'm trying to remember exact quote. He says, you know, remember he talked about Kempo existing in the uh, physical state, uh, uh, like a liquid state and then a yeah. gaseous state. And yeah. he said, he says, sometimes, you know, and the gaseous state was the highest because gas or vapor can move in all directions at mm -hmm. any given moment. And he told me, he says, sometimes, he says, I can move, I can think and I can move like that multidimensionally, you know, without any effort. But he mm -hmm. says, I can't always do that. And he says, I'm not sure why not. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you say that. It's funny I, you say that. You know, so I, you use the pyramid. And yeah. I think of the pyramid, but however, I think of the pyramid inverted the other oh. way. <laughs> We're at the base is the point, and we learn as we expand out. Let's go to Rodolfo down in Chile. I know that uh, English is not your first language, sir, but, you know, in the concepts and principles of uh, Kempo, I'm going to guess that you have uh, had some experience with Mr. Parker's teachings and writings, maybe not always with his writings, but if you have, good uh and your learnings what is it how does it feel for you do you use a lot of the reference when you you train or do you when you teach your students hello paul hello rodolfo it's good to see you life is hi hello honey <laughs> and me this is my translate translators today um eh, generalmente cuando Cuando doy clase a, a los patrones de movimiento. When he teach uh, uh, something related to the uh, movement patterns. Trato de hacer referencias. He works with uh, simple references. Eh, también de, o sea, más, más allá de, de mostrarles el patrón, sino que simplemente... Eh, Tratar de que entiendan que el movimiento que se hace diagonal, pues, por ejemplo, si nos tiramos al suelo, podemos hacer ese mismo movimiento. Y he works on, on, on trying to show how it works, even if it's vertical or horizon or, or uh, diagonal. Uh, you are standing up or in the floor. Uh, he tries to show single movements in this different uh, uh, shapes. I mean, just to the, to the 
or how it could be uh, the the school. Okay. So, so, you, so you're basically saying you use references to help you with your teaching. Yes. Okay, cool. Let's move over here and, and let's talk to a few new people that just joined us. It'd be nice to have them in here. Kenneth Gage. Hello, Ken. How you doing? Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. I'm glad no, I'm you're not. Never late. You're always welcome to the party. The party just started with you. <laughs> well, so, how you guys Kenny, all doing? Kenny, good. Kenny, we're talking about the, uh, the Art of War Campo style. You're new to Campo. Your background was in Taekwondo. But you've been involved with Campo now for several years. Yes, and um, have you used any references or have you read any of Mr. Mr. Parker's writings to help I haven't read. Yeah, I haven't read the writings, but def definitely being a part of, uh, you know, the Campo world now, listening to like Dennis Canaster, yourself, and even John Conway, and some of the others that I've dealt with, you know, the history that you guys all have to share. I'll be honest with you, there is more history and interest in learning about Kempo than there ever was with Taekwondo. Not that I ever want to bash on Taekwondo, but you know, I, I just love the history and the family that Kempo has. I see. And what's the relationship? Do you use Jurassic Park as an example? <laughs> hey, that's what I call my stuff, Jurassic Kempo. <laughs> Thank you, Kenny. That's cool. Let's go over. I see that we have uh, who else is in here that just Ruben. Ah, uh, Ruben is now now Ruben. I've known Ruben a long time. One of the nicest people. One of the most genuine, sincere people. Hardworking guy. He's overcome a lot of adversities in life, and now he's now he's working with AC Rainey, and he's teaching. Yeah. So, Ruben, your background yes, in Campo. How much? And he knew. By the way. Ruben knew Mr. Parker very well, okay, on a personal basis. Now I'm going to get away from the personal side, Ruben. How much did you learn from Mr. Parker through his writings? Well, I think the advantage was back then when Mr. Parker was writing his books and he finished his books, there was so much excitement around it where you had the, the author, the master of the art, and everybody else wanted to get on top of it, and we kept on going more in depth with the books, and that helped out a lot in regards to, um, you know, with Yosh and Tommy Chavez and you and everybody, you know, Frank Trejo, um, learning those concepts and the infinite insights. So that was, um, I guess, a blessing uh, having them there and everybody else there, and the books were so fresh. And you can always ask those questions to Mr. Parker to elaborate each chapter. Yeah, but isn't it true, Ruben, that not necessarily all of the people jumped on that bandwagon when those books came out? Some of them fell by the wayside and decided that it was not necessary? Well, I'd never listen to them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was always in Pasad I was always in the Pasadena school, so you know that that was a a big plus, also. You know, and everybody everybody got the book there. Yeah, Ruben, what did what Frank used to call it? Pasadena style. Ah, uh, Pasadena style. Yeah, yeah just a little <laughs> reminder. So anyway, so you're looking at books you've read them um, over the years. Anything that stands out, it jumps out at you that you still refer to. <sighs> I don't know if they, I haven't read them for more than 30 years because um, I started coming back to Kempo after 30 years. And, um, but I, be, I think they became instincts on a lot of things and you just have to come back and refresh yourself. But once you learn the reasoning why and you understand it, it becomes second nature. Okay. Anything you remember Mr. Parker sharing with you personally? Demonstrating it and feeling the pain. Okay. I'm glad I missed that one. <laughs> oh, that's the best part. Yeah, that's no, the best part. <laughs> no, I've been I'm being a lot facetious of, to those that know me. Okay. I, was, I was in a lot of his um, seminars and his demos back then at studios. Sure. I, I was always with Frank Trejo and I was always at the studio. That was my second home. So I was the sidekick with Mr. Trails wherever 
he went, I went, and Mr. Parker was there sometimes. And like I said, we'll go to his house or go to a television studio and, and discuss the internationals and all these other things. But um, yeah, that was a big privilege. Let's, let's move on. So let's talk about, so I initially said, uh, looking at Sun Tzu's book, wherever I did with it just a few minutes ago. Oh, here. Uh, I talked about the five heads as he did. So his considerations were these five. And then he went into each of those, those five individually, three, four spot, different aspects, different subtopics and whatnot. Let's talk about the, um, the, what Mr. Parker says in chapter 11, the preparatory considerations. And Dr. Totten talked on it just the first two, which are truly essential to what's going on here. But let's see what, you know, let's, let's address this stuff. And let's go over down here and talk about that. Joe Rebello, tell us about the eight considerations. How do you teach them? Which ones stand out to you? Well, let's, let's start at this question. I want to go back to a couple others in, in a moment. But again, the preparatory considerations. I had a wonderful uh, student, a white belt student of all groups, who was looking at Infinite Insights, Volume 1, and had said, you know what? When I was in college, I had different analogies to help me remember material. And as I was learning the preparatory considerations, I got a great sentence. And I said, what was the sentence? He goes, alligators eat real people many times using natural weapons and natural defenses. Alligators, A, acceptance. Accept the fact there are dangers in this world and you are not immune to them. E, eat, environment, as we talked about earlier. What's around you, what's on you, what's in you. As Dennis alluded to earlier, I'm in the dead of winter, I'm in the ski parker, and I've got the flu. Another great analogy a friend of mine once gave me, I'm in a crowded bar, I'm in tight jeans, and I'm drunk. So alligators eat real, are, range, long, media, medium, and short range, understanding those ranges and the distance between yourself and your opponent or multiple opponents. Alligators eat real people, P, positions, positions of hands, feet, and body in relationship to yourself and your opponent. T, times, targets, available and unavailable, and how to make those unavailable targets available to you and make sure your targets are unavailable to your opponent. Alligators read people many times using, and again, the last two are given, natural weapons and natural defenses. The way we use our natural parts of our body to defend ourselves and to attack our opponent. You know, it's amazing when you look at Infinite Insights, how late in the book that particular portion is, yet how it's placed so early in the five volumes to give us our foundation for what goes on in our later volumes. Earlier, we were talking about Ed Parker and his ability to achieve a particular state. In volume five of Infinite Insights, he discusses super consciousness. Yep. It's from a book he read about achieving the super conscious state where I the conscious and the subconscious state unify and in that brief shining moment, achieve a higher level, a higher state of understanding. Now for me to help my students, again, I use that alligators eat real people many times uh, analogy. Uh, and I also make sure when I can, if possible, read certain <laughs> elements of the infinite insights to my students to encourage them to purchase them. Again, also utilizing the various terminology. The reason, the reason that that gentleman earlier was so fascinated by the, by the volume four, Mr. Parker dedicates no less than 24 pages to the universal pattern, dissecting the various geometric shapes of sacred geometry built within. Also, when we talked earlier about the pyramid and the uh, iceberg analogy, that is one of the keystone geometric shapes by the diamond in the center of the universal pattern the two triangles separated by that intersecting horizontal line. It's one of the key ingredients that we use, whether we're using the universal pattern relationship to the star block blocking system or other elements. All these different stories that Mr. Parker would get, all these various references and various connotations and various elements of art are what really gave the beauty of Ed Parker simplifying sophistication, right? You always heard, Kempo is nothing more than, than sophisticated simplicity. And that's really the key ingredient. Lao Tzu tries to achieve it the same way. You yourself read about it in understanding the different divisions and different ranks. Well, do we not do the same thing in Kempo? Do we not have the same material and breakdown of organization and material presented? Of 
course we do. And that's the beauty of the art. Dr. Talkton earlier talked about that elevated sub, sublemal consciousness, right? Correct on that? Yes. So let's move down to Florida. And if you ever play golf in Florida, remember there are alligators and crocodiles, I guess alligators, <laughs> on the golf course. I know this. I was on, I was in Orlando playing, and I was on hole number eight, and there was Clyde. They called him Clyde. It was a par three. I the guy hit it. I said, "Forget the ball. Let's just keep on going, and let him eat the ball." I, go, I don't care about a three dollar title. Okay. I want my ball. For, well, yeah. Sadly, the guy I was playing name was name is Dan. So I said, "Forget it. We're not going to get that ball, even though you want it." So let's go down to Florida. Let's go down to Florida and talk to Cynthia. Are you available now, dear? Can you hear me? Yay! Yes. There oh my she is. Hey, well, Cynthia Graham, you've been in Kemple for a long time. Give everybody a little bit of a background on how long you've been in, in Kemple. I just started yesterday. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in it, well, I'm going to be 55. I've been at it since I was, wow. Do I have wow. to say? Okay. Wow. When you were wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but you had an it see the thing is you had a personal relationship uh learning and having uh conversations with ed parker so so you've been around a long time in the campbell world so yes. from your point of view as a and i'm not trying as a as a campbell black belt instructor what do you address when the issues when you're teaching your students and how much reference do you use to any of Mr. Parker's writings? Well, I um, first I have to know who I'm teaching, and then I have to see their needs. And then from there, what I do is I try to match what they need with the amount of knowledge or what type of knowledge I start with. Because, you know, it depends on what the person is. You start teaching where that person is. Am I correct, Mr. Dennis? To get where you want them to be, you got to start with where they are. Yes, sir. So that's what I do. I do an, a, a lot of analysis, try to get to know the person, see what their background is, if they've been hurt, whatnot. I train police officers, so therefore, you know, they're very familiar in knowing um, when things go bad, you recount everything. When things go good, sometimes you can't even remember what you're writing down because it just happened really quick without you thinking. It's like, um, uh, for instance, I give references to my students. Kempo to me is like, when I'm driving home, not paying attention, I get home and I'm like, wow, I didn't even pay attention. I stopped at every light, I, you know? I don't know if anybody else, I do my thing in my car when I'm driving home. Does anybody ever feel like that? You know? No. 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 <laughs> I, I, I've woken up at home and I'm going, okay, here, I, and I'm going, wow, I don't remember going past such and such a place. Yep. Where, where was I at? Man, I hope I didn't stop. I did stop at the light, you know, exactly. and, and, but I don't remember it. But it's like, you know, all of a sudden out here shuts off, brain takes over and says, okay, let me read what's going on. I've been here before. We've trained here before. Have you driven thousands of times? You got this, you know, and that's one of the analysis that, you know, one, one of the analogies I give to a lot of my students and they're like, oh, okay, I, I get it, you know, and I, so I, I try to, to fit the individual, the individual with how much knowledge they can understand. Because honestly, I have, I have issues sometimes, you know, with, with the patterns. And I just look at it and go, okay, I know how to do it. And I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've had street knowledge because I've walked with the guardian angels out in, in Manhattan. And we've done a lot of fighting on the streets, unfortunately. But, you know, honestly... There have been times that some of the concepts and theories and, and, and you know, the infinite insights have kept kind of like guessing, wow, am I, am I really, what, I'm trying to fit science into my movement now, you know, it's possible to me sometimes, but at times it just sinks in so well. And I learn it by watching a student or describing what I'm doing. Student. So it's kind of, it's challenging for me at times because you I know, start. I'm sorry. I, I, a, a previous interview we had, we had the women of Kempo, and I'm going to address that because you are the only female on our 
on our board right here that's talking, your awareness and environmental aware, well, you're looking at acceptance, which is looking that things will happen, bad things can happen, which you know that we probably have happened in your life. And then your environmental awareness, how important is that in your analogy and when you're teaching students? Well, I got to see who I'm teaching. You know, it's, um, if, I'm, if I'm teaching, you know, uh, for my beginners, I have to make sure they know how to feel comfortable with me in order to understand where I'm coming from. I got to learn their language because not everyone learns the same way. You know, you can't talk to everyone the same way you do. You know, I, I you know, a regular civilian uh, off the street than I would talk. Okay. A cop carries a gun. They have, they have knowledge. This person might not have knowledge. So I have to, like you said, start as a pyramid. I can't throw a lot of physic uh, physic terms at them. Okay. Um, a medium range student, once they start learning, we start working on being able to move with that balance. Control. We start taking that self-esteem that has been building from all these techniques and working. All right. And my advanced students, we, we, we open up it and we start using techniques on each other very um, on certain levels you know one one level being really soft tapping next level being higher going all the way up to five maybe even doing these techniques while we're sparring i sometimes stop and say Boom, five swords and they do it on each other you know so we try to be spontaneous because because of my experience being an attack victim like i said i started campo not because i wanted to learn an art but because i wanted to learn survival I didn't want to be hurt anymore. And I've been attacked after Kempo. And you know something? Something Mr. Parker once told me. He says, you know, you're little. You got to get low. You got to get in there. And you got to get through it. That's what you got to do. Just remember those things. Get low, get in, and get Because uh, Greg, <laughs> let's go to Greg. Greg, tell us about range. How do you explain that? your interpretation on uh, the range consideration in the eight considerations. I, I, I stick to the, the, the principle of range that Mr. Parker uh, explained, you know, the, the four basic ranges, out of contact, within contact, contact penetration, contact control manipulation range. And I, I, I stress how important that staying out of contact range is to begin with, you know, uh, your best, the best way to, to win a fight or uh, survive a fight is not to get in it or in an altercation. So too many people are eager to get into contact range and then they're overzealous and find themselves in contact manipulation range, or, I'm sorry, penetration range and they're in manipulation range when they should really be working more on maneuvers and finding their safe zones by stand out of contact range or even just on the barrier within contact. Dr. You know, Totten, might... your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah, Totten, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I was remembering Mr. Parker saying many times that the first rule of self-defense is don't get hit. <laughs> and there are a lot of ways to not get hit. Um, I'm thinking about the very last time I was actually attacked on the street. I, I can remember the very last one. And I was actually uh, working as a medic at a huge street fair you know, over 100,000 people on the street. And my job was to make sure that they stayed healthy. <laughs> and so some guy was causing trouble. I think he was on drugs. The guy was not looking, talking, acting right. And security was talking to that guy. And I'm shocked they didn't just throw him out. But for some strange reason, they called me over there and they wanted me to calm him down or something. I, I don't know why. And so... I, I didn't know. Now the guy, he's hopped up. He looks like he's on speed or something. And he's yelling and screaming at the two security guys that had stopped him from doing what he was trying to do. But they brought me over there. So I didn't trust the guy, frankly. And so I stood there kind of like this, you know, my hand here, the other hand under here, you know, basically I'm in a stance. I'm in a, a, a concealed cat stance. I don't trust the guy. <laughs> and all he's not even looking at me. He's looking at the two security guards. But then out of nowhere, the guy throws a haymaker right at my nose as hard as he can. And since I was standing like this, I parried it. I grasped his wrist. And then I was getting ready to knock his lights out. But then I said, I was thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute. You're medical. 
You can't be beating this guy up. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree. You could have fixed him after the fact. And so I, I blocked him. I grabbed his wrist. And then instead of hitting him, I just pushed him to the side. He lost his balance and fell over. And then he turned around like nothing had happened. It's as if the attack had just left his mind. And he kept on just talking to security. It was the strangest thing. Mr. Canaster, uh, aren't also foot maneuvers an important part of that too? Controlling range, distance, and environment. Well, well that's the next step, though, right? But maneuvers that the two most important basics you have are stances, which in, no matter what you're in right now, we're all in some sort of stance right now. Uh, but the thing is, after that, foot maneuvers are the second most important basic. Mr. Parker told me, "quote unquote," hey, oftentimes before you can get a block, a punch, a kick. You've got the maneuver in the position. Oh my God! And, and so you know that the. That, that, I love you, Dennis. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly word for word what he said, and and it made a lot of sense. You know, he's absolutely right. As long as he doesn't can... start to mimic that last conversation, okay, go ahead. Hey, well, maybe I'll start. Do I need to get my hair so I can <laughs> you know kind of be able to shake it and actually look like? <laughs> oh Lord. So, <laughs> and then, then I can, then I can make a comment about my little one. But, uh, but, but you know, you're absolutely right, Zach. You know, I'm going to have to do a hell of a lot of editing when this is all done. <laughs> oh, you bet. <laughs> understanding foot maneuvers are, are is a critical uh, component of your basics, and so I, I can't emphasize foot maneuvers enough. You got to be able to know. You know, first of all, you, you know, you got as an example, you have a you know, a, a step drag forward, okay? But how many step drag forwards do you have? And I don't mean right and left. There are numerous ones. You can step an inch and drag five inches. You can step three inches and drag one inch. You, you know, there's, there's numerous combinations numerically of, of what you can drag. So there's a, there's a number of them and they all have to do with positioning. You know, they have moving up the circle, moving out of the way stepping off angle if you will you know all that is, is all positioning now we don't what, always refer to it as that but that's what it is one of the things that i work with uh with the students i work with is removing your hands and arms out of the training and focusing mostly on foundation uh issues footwork stances countering that way sticky legs as we call it and i think it's really important because if you have a good foundation, Mr. Uh, Rabello, you can respond. You're not going to think about it like Cindy was saying earlier. She's just going to react as she was driving because she has coordinated the hand-eye uh, relationship, her foot. She knows what she's doing. It's second nature to you. Yeah, when you have to worry about your stances, uh, you have some problems there. And I hate to say it, going back in and trying to correct problems with uh, students that have trained with somebody else, that occasionally causes a, a formable task. Am I correct well, in that, Dr. Well, Totten? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, I think, uh, was it Cindy who said something that, uh, someone, one of you said that uh, sometimes in, in a, no, maybe it wasn't you. It was someone who said that sometimes it's easier to teach someone who's a beginner, who doesn't come in with a lot of preconceived notions that might not be correct. And, uh, and then you can kind of mold them from the beginning and you know, give them things like Mr. Parker's books to read so they get a good stable foundation from the beginning. Uh, because otherwise, if people don't, if they haven't done a lot of thinking about what they do and they've just been training along a very narrow range, they have a lot of uh, habits and they may not all be good habits. And then we have to break those habits and that's uh, difficult. Zach, your thoughts? Well, a lot of this relates to the Japanese principle of no mind. So in martial arts, we repeatedly do stuff or we do training like sticky legs or uh, all the foot maneuvers and everything. And you're doing that for a reason. So if something happens in the street or driving your car or whatever it is you do, like being a bartender, it's automatic. You automatically go to, and if someone asks you, what'd you do? You really stand back and go, I don't know. I don't know what I did. The last attack that I had, and you know about this, Paul, the guy just came at me, and I just reacted and basically put him to sleep without even knowing what I did. That and was I a Target. It was a Blue Walmart. Light Special. 
Walmart. <laughs> oh, that's where it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it just happened real quickly. And the whole, the whole thing about it was, is like, uh, you know, taking your environment into the account. When I was walking to my car, I saw him approaching me out of the corner of my eye. And I was automatically getting in a defensive posture without being threatening. And I use that a lot in what I do in bartending because a lot of it is how you do and how you read body language and then how you approach them in your voice and your mannerisms. So that's all part of self-defense. It's all part of having that Japanese part of no mind. It's experience, but you have to learn to apply it in a defensive situation. So hopefully you don't have to get confrontational in, in a fight. We're talking right there of the circumstances in Mr. Parker's concept of freestyling. I talked to this with uh, Dennis Kanatzer about it, and he was telling me nobody with a one person you train on yourself, and you have two people, no contact, light contact, medium contact, full contact, and then the other aspect, street fighting. If that's the case, let's back it up and go to Rodolfo quickly. Rodolfo. You train as a fighter. You fight a lot of full contact matches, okay? How do you prepare your mind to fight a full contact, which has rules, and then we're going to jump over, and I'm going to ask Marshall, what is it like to fight with, with no rules? Does that make sense? Rules versus no rules. So, Rodolfo, what are your thoughts on that? When entry in the... Intro a la pelea. Fight the fight. When is my moment? When is the correct time to start no. uh, the fight? Porque una vez que empiezo, start. Paro hasta que uno de los dos caiga. I cannot stop until one uh, will finish the uh, the fighting. One falls. Well, it's funny. Is uh, Cindy? You said you had some uh, confrontations where you actually got into physical fighting on the street. Relate that to us. Versus a uh, uh, structured fighting in the school. I agree. What um, what's going on? Uh, basically, um, fighting. I don't get to dictate sometimes how deep somebody gets ar around me. There might be two attackers, which I've had to deal with, and you know I can't. And I've got to deal with understanding if I'm going to uh, if I'm going to be attacked in the street. I've got to ready my mind for what is going to hit me. I've got, I can't freak out, and this is something that Rodolfo said, you have to have fear from it. So in class, you are to learn how to understand something coming at you, because as a beginner, and I remember this as an attack victim, when something came at my face, it was like, sparring was constant blinking. I have some men that I train like that, that have been in, in like um, some war veterans and stuff because of flashes, that if something comes at their eyes, they're blinking. So I have to go through a different tactic to get them out of that because not only do I have to train their body, but I have to train their mind. As far as school is concerned, like I said, as they come and as they are as people, I have to figure out what Kempo, how Kempo is going to fit to the, the individual. I have to fit Kempo to the individual and then start pouring in the knowledge and see how much they're retaining. Because if I get into a fix right away, and I lose this student, it's not helpful. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Marshall, your thoughts on that? As far as in the street, my I grew up in New York. I uh, moved to California when I was 20. Even growing up in New York, my, my main thing was we use a lot of reflections to constantly check our environment. You learn that as a kid growing up there. You use reflections off the, the, the windows and the mirrors. So I was constantly, even before I started camp, I was constantly learning who was around me. Um, environment, people who you're probably going to engage, and what are you willing to do? What am I willing to do to save my life? Do I need to, do I need to go that far, or can I just do enough to give them time to think? Dennis, uh, your thoughts? I have enough training. <laughs> I, don't know. I know enough Kempo. <laughs> You know it all. No, you know, it is that how it works for you? You know, you know. We, 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 what we about Mr. This. Foreman? You were telling me the story about George Foreman today. Come on. Well, you know, like I was talking to, to Paul, you know, in terms of enough training, uh, and I used George Foreman as an example, but it could, could hold true to 
to any professional boxer. I mean, they are professional boxers. They, they've knocked people out. They, they got incredible records. Mike Tyson. Uh, Mike Tyson, as good as he was, did he still train, you know, for every fight? Uh, even though he was probably good enough. But you know what? You, you got to keep training. You got to keep sharp. You got to keep active, you know. And so the, my question is, did, did Mike have it? Did Mike know enough? Well, yeah, he knew enough. But he wanted to make sure he knew enough. And and sometimes that knowing enough, maybe mentally or physically, for whatever reason, wasn't enough that particular day. But the point is, you still had to go work out, even at a top level of your game, being a professional. So coming down to our street level, our little Kempo people here, most of us are not that professional. So to say you know enough to save yourself, but you know, I, I, I question that. You know, if it was my student, I'd say, well, we need to go back and, and, and revisit this and look at what you're talking about. Do you really know enough? Maybe we need to have a little more of a rough sparring session. Greg, your thoughts? <laughs> well, since I've never really been in a fight or an altercation ever. How long have you been married, Greg? <laughs> I, I was married once, but I've been divorced for over 20 years. So. Okay, now we wait, know. Wait, okay. wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me say, Greg is full of beans. He was a guard in a prison in, in Vegas. And I think <laughs> the last I knew of him, which has been years, he had at least five lawsuits against him. Oh, my God. In, in they, were, they weren't lawsuits. They were uh, in, like the they're the cop. They're the, they were the uh, equivalent to internal affairs investigation. But anyways, but, oh my god! But I, I also uh, okay. I uh, not I'll, a bad way. Tell us about it. Way, just sometimes <laughs> you get physical. You have to get physical sometimes, and uh, they do investigations when they they have to. But once they were really kind of par for the course. But I've worked in nightclubs. I've done personal security and all that. I mean, so. Without disclosing any specifics, names, and whatnot, how much did your training come into effect to deal with those real-life situations? Every single time. Okay. And the majority of it, every single time. The majority was, of it, uh, when I started, because I, I started training in Kempo when I was 15. So, uh, wow. so um, a lot of it had to do, you know, I'm, I'm big on environmental awareness and staying, avoiding problems, seeing before they happen. And, you know, it, it's you have to you have to go through some of these things. You know, freestyle helps with the training your instinctive uh, motion, I guess you'd say. But uh, yeah, every single time. You know, I mean, last altercation I can recall was standing in a line at a buffet at the M Casino. Wow. Guy decided he wanted to make. He was a little drunk. He was a little intoxicated. I saw it coming a mile away. Tried to get my distance. He kept closing the gap. So my my sweetheart and my son to move back, move back, kept backing up, back. He finally wouldn't quit. I saw the saw the hand coming, and then I decided to close the gap and take control of the situation. But was in line at a waiting for a, a buffet line at the M, waiting to get seated for dinner. So you never know what's going to happen in, in the environment we're in now. Mobility to me is the biggest one that you want to train. Stability, mobility, mobility, stability. Mm -hmm. Always be able to move, move, move. Because you know, I, I've, I've dabbled in uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a few years. I play with it with my buddies. I would no, no way say I know it that well, but I, I encourage uh, experience at it so that you know what it is and how to identify and use it to get back up on your feet. But uh, today's environment yeah. that you can look on the news every day and see, yeah, they're not coming at you one-on-one. -on -one. You're going to get overpowered if you're not careful. And you better be aware of your environment, stay out of it. Mobility and stability is your main factors. And <clears throat> well, I, I Ed, would Parker's say Campo, Ed Parker's Campo has been a factor every single time for me. Well, I, would also um, think, I would also think that when you're in a confrontation, it's best to end it as quickly as possible. Yeah, if you got to yeah, decide, you're gonna, it's like like Cindy was saying, I'm familiar with Mr. Parker saying that because he shared something similar to that to me too, and and that is, you got to know if you decide you're going to be in it, get all the way in it and go through it because yeah, so get it if, on. if you have any hesitation, if you have any hesitation, that, that he who hesitates, you know, meditates in a horizontal position. So yeah, he, he told me, but, he, ahead, he said to me, he said, if you can't get out of it, get in it. That that's what I heard too. He said you can't get out, get all the way in, and go sure. through it. That's right. And I and I might I might say with 
with Greg for the last uh, story that I remember he told me, you don't want to mess with Greg. You know, he was on the second level in the in the prison, and this guy came out him, and I think he tried to shank him. Oh, that was just, uh, that, yeah. He was shaking another guy, and I was breaking it up. And then he came at me with the shank. And, but, and what did you do? He learned what to fly. You... He learned to fly that day. <laughs> Greg Greg threw him over the balcony. You know, it's only, and, it was uh, only one story up. He hit the concrete. He, he landed on his shoulder, so he was okay. He didn't land on his head. He landed on his that, shoulder. That, that's, what, that's one story too high for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe Rabello. Uh, yeah. Joe huh? Rabello. So, gentlemen, you know, we were talking about positions. We're talking about maneuvers. We're talking about reality. So let's give two quick Ed Parker stories. Position. Mr. Parker's with Professor Chow at a restaurant in Hawaii. Restaurant bar. Mr. Professor Chow worked as security guard. And apparently he had busted a couple of guys who were in the bar, catching them stealing stuff off the construction site and being Professor Chow wrecked them. So this guy decides he's going to smash Professor Chow's skull face open with a beer bottle. And he reaches down and grabs him and he winds up to smash him in the face. And Mr. Parker says, that was the first time I ever saw a lone kimono because he pinned him, lifted his arm, locked his arm and broke it, buckled it, chopped him dead in the throat and sent him flying and never got out of the chair. <laughs> so position is what's dictated to us sometimes yeah. now your homework assignment go home and try all your techniques in a chair yeah. maneuvers ed parker's at the pasadena studio and this kid walks in it's in the 70s he's walked like bruce lee with the black kung fu pants and the white you know tank top and he's got this cane in his hand and he's looking at mr parker and he's talking really slow and he goes mr. Parker, they say you're pretty fast but I have something I think is faster. And he raises up the cane and he sees there's like a like spear tip on the freaking end of it. And the kid had a ballista. And he fired the thing and Mr. Parker, because he couldn't step, he maneuvered with his upper body. Again, his dad was a boxer. He learned first things he learned was the bob, slip, and weave, body maneuvers. And he reached into his cowboy boot and he pulled out this little derringer that Elvis had given him, this beautiful pearl handled derringer. And he Stuck it right in the kid's face, right in his cheek. And he was going to pull the trigger. And then he realized if he pulled the trigger, it would go through the kid's cheek and out and shatter that beautiful big window in his office. <laughs> so instead, he grabs his phone and he slams the kid upside the head and it knocks him out cold. The joys of environmental weaponry. Now, if those aren't stories about positions and maneuvers, you tell me what is. Right. And in reality, I've been shot at, I've been stabbed, I've been slashed with a straight razor trying to slip my throat, I've been attacked with an axe handle swinging at me and trying to strangle me. As experiences go, they all sucked. <laughs> but I'm still able to talk about them. And that was your I'm first marriage. <laughs> no, I got married in divorce. I got smelled after the first time. Thank <laughs> you so much. Uh, oh, you always bring it so colorful. Greg. Uh, are the books still available through the IKK? They are, but most you can get them through the IKK the website on their store shop shop store button there, and you can also they're still available also on Amazon. And uh, they I should have, probably have be a, available on physical... Tiger Claw as well. A oh. Tiger Claw. Mm -hmm. yep. I just wanted to I be have, sure so that we talked physical... about them. I wanted to be able to let people know that, that there are places where they can go to find them. Absolutely. And please read them and study them and ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's been a tremendous uh, uh, discussion here today on the art of war, Campo style. I'm really grateful that Zach Carter, Ruben Pereira, you know, Carl Totten, Joe Ribello, Cynthia Graham, Greg Hildebrandt, Rodolfo Kuntzman, all the way from Chile, Marshall Rao, Dennis Knasser, and Kenneth Gage, uh, could be participating in this. We're continuing on with this. This will be a six series uh, discussion because next well, next time we're going to be talking about volume two. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you. Have a great weekend. It's really a pleasure to, to see everyone and thank you for your participation. See you guys. Good. 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 Good.